Coming up next on Art Rocks, we find out what sort of vision it takes to transform a block of wood into a masterpiece. Well, in Louisiana, um, wood art is um, just ever, it's just bountiful. I mean, there's wood everywhere. Um, when I drive down streets, I, all I can see is a pallet. Explore the legacy of an Iranian-born musician philosopher whose work fused ancient Persian thought with the aesthetics of the modern age. Spent a quiet life, an introspective life, playing his instrument to communicate with the higher power. We meet a young man whose art literally speaks for itself. I had to help Kevin to be Kevin, not to make him like somebody else and learn some life lessons as ballet teaches them. The wonderful thing about classical ballet training is it prepares a child for any career they pursue. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks. I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. Today we are visiting a Louisiana man with a gift for transforming salvaged timber into pieces of art that are as functional as they are aesthetically pleasing. My name is Leopold Frelo and I'm a wood turner. Well, my art is very, I would say, unique um, in a way that each piece that I make, it's one of a kind. The uh, figure and the grain patterns in the wood dictate how the final piece will come out. My style would be uh, functional. I love turning pieces that people can actually use. Um, I hate making things um, that somebody just kind of puts up on a shelf and just looks at it instead of holds it and uses it on a daily basis. Well in Louisiana um, wood art is um, just ever, it's just bountiful. I mean there's wood everywhere. Um, when I drive down streets, I, all I can see is a pallet. My local favorite wood is sycamore, um, from the sycamore trees that grow in everybody's yards, because you can actually take it and cut it in different angles and get a totally different effect, you know, other than, say, woods like oak and um, cypress. You know, you usually get the same effect every time you, you cut into it. Usually the wood will dictate what comes out. Um, you know, I'll leave edges here, I'll leave um, bug um, holes here. You know, all that becomes part of the natural story and, you know, it ends up becoming a conversation piece. And, you know, I am an environmentalist. Um, you know, I do things to protect the environment. Um, I don't um, participate in any kind of um, lumber programs that go out and just deforest. Um, the stories behind some of the pieces, um, you know, are, are very um, unique in their own way. I'll get uh, folks to call me that maybe had a tree growing in their yard from when they were children, and you know, here comes a storm and takes it down. So they want something to remember that tree by, because they used to climb the tree when they were kids. Um, you know, I had a family in Plaquemine that, that had a black walnut tree in, in that way. Also. Um, just like the big um, Thomas Boyd oak that fell on the state capitol lawn. I was called in to harvest some of that wood to uh, make gavels and um, strike plates for the House of Representatives, which will be um, produced soon. So, um, you know, all those things like that just add more character and more meaning behind the wood itself. So it, it becomes um, more or less a, um, a relic, something to cherish forever. Well. Art, to me, um, it's important because it is part of my culture, first of all. Um, I grew up in a Creole community where we did carpentry on a daily basis. Um, everybody put in their share of the work to get things um, going. 
and um, when I do wood art I kind of keep it um, keep that in mind and also try to portray and to keep the culture going I have two boys and you know maybe one day they'll get involved with it and keep it going in their respect also You can see more of Leopold's work by visiting perfectwoodworks.com. No matter where you live in Louisiana, opportunities to connect with the arts are everywhere, if only you know where to look. So here's a list of some of the goings on in the arts around the state. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, visit the website at lpb.org slash artrocks or pick up a free copy of Country Roads magazine. LPB's Art Rocks website also features an archive of previous episodes, so to see any segment again, just log on to lpb.org. This next report links ancient and contemporary Iran through the works of Kurdish musician and spiritual thinker Ostad Elahi. Born in western Iran at the dawn of the 20th century, Alahi watched the traditions of the ancient world give way to the modern age. Yet in his music and his philosophical thought, Elahi managed to remain faithful to both. Ken Moore, a curator at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, introduces us to the sacred lute, the art of Ostad Elahi. <laughs> Welcome, I'm Ken Moore, the Frederick P. Rose Curator in Charge of Musical Instruments, and I'd like to welcome you to a wonderful exhibition called The Sacred Lute, The Art of Osted Elahi. Osted Elahi grew up in a village in western Iran. He was born in 1895 and went with Iran through a transition period of modernization and then died in 1974. He was considered the greatest and most influential modern player of the tambour. He began his life under his father's tutelage. He was learning to play the instrument by watching and right away they recognized that he was a prodigy. He studied music, sacred texts, and then by the time he was nine, he really was a master and had learned all of the hymns and regional music that was around him in this Kurdish village. This instrument was the instrument of Hajj Nematola. Osted Elahi's father. It dates from 1880. When his father played his instrument, he would sometimes kiss it before playing. It's a symbol of respect, a symbol of the idea that this is a means of connecting with something larger, with the divine. After his father dies, he goes into contemplation, decides what he should do with his life, whether he should stay with his father's teaching. But he decides that it's time to be modern. He goes to Tehran. He is in the environment of the Reza Shah, who is modernizing the country. And he was part of the first class in this new judicial system. In the exhibition, we have a rather large case with the judicial robes and cap 
that he wore, and on this robe is a white sash with 11 gold leaves on it, which indicates the highest rank in the judicial system. He went to different places, learned more about music in different regions, was known as being a very fair, just person, and spent a quiet life, an introspective life, playing his instrument to communicate with the higher power. He retires, and he's discovered as a musician. But he was reluctant to have even his music recorded. Ostadalahi was the first person to use all 10 fingers, five fingers on both hands, just flying. And he particularly had a kind of controlled way of doing this, a very evenness about that. This is part of the mastery of an instrument and he was a consummate master. One of the more interesting instruments is a setar, which belonged to Hostetalahi. It's a small, flat instrument that is very narrow. It doesn't have the rounded back. It was built for traveling. And one of the things that Hostetalahi did was he actually designed instruments. We have a very beautiful instrument which has its origins in Shiraz. It's called a tar. The instrument that we have was one that Ostad Allahi is said to have used daily to play Persian classical music. Other instruments, and maybe one that's unlikely, is a violin. He also played two wind instruments. He was a multi-instrumentalist, and I think this is something that when people hear his music, they think, well, he's so fantastic on the tambour that uh, how could he possibly show an interest in, in, in anything else? But he certainly did and was accomplished in all of them. The instruments are one thing, but then we have objects that show his connectedness to a dervish tradition. And one of the things that is most beautiful is a beggar's bowl. One would use this bowl to go out and to beg. And the funds that you would gather would then go to the poor, to the hungry. So this is one object that's not only beautiful, but has this wonderful idea of giving back of teaching humility. And we have a case filled with transcriptions of music that he did with special notation, little zeros and X's which indicate ornamentation. One of the more interesting uh, manuscripts that we have is from Knowing the Spirit. This is a book that he wrote about the journey of the soul. And it's one of his more intense theological writings. I think Osted Allahi would be surprised by his legacy, by the people that he has influenced, the performers, the audience, the, the people who read his philosophy. I think he was such an intimate person playing in an intimate setting that he never expected to have an exhibition anywhere, probably would have told us not to do it. He would rather us come to his home, sit quietly, listen, feed off our energy, and our spirit and do his improvisations for himself and for us right there live.
To see more of this influential performer's work, visit ostadalahi.com. Sacramento, California artist Kevin Mount is a man of few words, but through his art, he speaks volumes. Here's his story. My name is Kevin Mount. I am 21 years old and I love to paint. It's very interesting the way it happened with Kevin because he started painting and doing drawings since he was very little. And I didn't pay much attention to it, honestly, because I thought that all the kids do the same. But as he grew older and older and I continued visiting the same houses, there were no more pictures in the refrigerators anymore. And I was overwhelmed by the amount of paintings I had of Kevin. I like to use watercolors. Watercolors, I use more color than water because I like bright colors and I use small brushes. Paintings and brushes, bright and colorful. Everything is that bright and colorful that I paint. He never stopped painting. It was just art. He couldn't do anything else. He developed fine until he was three years old. I was at three years old that we got the first one, that it was asthma. Four came the viral LIGO. At five came the autism. At seven, I believe, came the ulcerative colitis. When he was 15 years old at Stanford, it came as a neuronal potassium blockage. What it means is that the immune cells, all the gates for the potassium are blocked. So his organs function without potassium. There's no cure for that. My focus was do therapies and tutorials and all kind of stuff trying to fix Kevin. <laughs> and it took time for me to realize that I had to help Kevin to be Kevin, not to make him like somebody else. And when that happened, everything changed. He's always so happy, and he likes people to see his art. He likes to share his art. All his paintings are bright and colorful. That one is a Japanese girl that is blue, and it's black and red. And this one is a, a cat with blue face and it's black spots and yellow eyes. And the next one we have is a the birds. All those parrots are a little bit big, so they have blue beaks and they're red. The other one is orange and they have purple and blue. All the animals come from the rainforest, they have all those bright colors. This one is the Joseph and the Amazing Tension Card Dream Code that we went to see at the Music Circus. It was amazing, so. The show was great, so the, all the code is a little bit liner and it's all the rainbow colors. He always surprises me, every day surprises me. His car is just my passion, my connection with the world. He goes once a month to an infusion of uh, immunoglobulin to Sari Hospital. Um, when he goes, he's hooked with needles and carrying all his equipment, doing the treatment and draws and paints with uh, markers in this board. And people love it because these people go for very, very heavy treatments. And it's just to relax them, just to see Kevin painting for them. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. Other people appreciate Kevin's art. I think that that's the best gift. I'm very thankful because in a way, I've been taking care of him, but he's been raising me you know, to be a more complete person and appreciate little things. I know now what a passion is. That's the biggest lesson that Kevin had given me, is that I know what a passion is. A passion is not something that you like or you do it as a hobby. A passion is when you are consistent, determined, and you have the strength and the courage not to stop. He wants to be an artist, which I think that he is already. But 
in his mind. He knows, you know, that the world is waiting for him. My dream is to go to art school. To go to art school, you have to make sure you finish all your schoolwork, get that done, and then when you finish all the schoolwork, then you go to art school and then to college. I think that Kevin had a lot of purpose, not just the art. It's to make a change on people to appreciate the world different. And I think that he can make a difference in, in the world. I like to create art for everybody. I love creating. We're gonna do paint forever. Back on home turf now for our Louisiana Treasures segment. In New Orleans Lower Ninth Ward, the Louisiana National Guard Museum at Jackson Barracks is a hidden gem awaiting discovery. The Ansel M. Stroud Jr. Military History and Weapons Museum tells the story of the Louisiana National Guard, from its beginnings as a colonial French militia to its modern day missions, both at home and abroad. The museum sits on the border of Orleans and St. Bernard parishes, about a mile from Chalmette Battlefield, where, in 1815, Andrew Jackson defeated the British in the Battle of New Orleans. The Guard's history as the early militia begins with Bienville's founding of New Orleans, and continues through Louisiana's Spanish period and into the 19th century as an American force. Louisiana militia played a major role in Jackson's victory, as well as in other American conflicts like the U.S. Civil War. The history continues as the Guard modernized and took part in 20th century conflicts like World War I and World War II. Exhibits also feature more recent events like the Gulf War of 1991, as well as recent Louisiana unit deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Reminders of the Guard's activation during emergency response missions like Hurricanes Katrina and Rita are also proudly displayed. But long before that, Guardsmen had played by major roles in recovering from the Great Flood of 1927 and Hurricanes Audrey and Betsy. Vehicles, weapons, equipment, uniforms, photographs and other artifacts, in addition to video commentary from the soldiers themselves, are used to relay the stories of these citizen soldiers. The Guard is unique within the military because of its local connection with communities throughout the entire state. Whether it's a flood, a hurricane, or an oil spill, they are always here for us. Finally, established in 1985, the Miami City Ballet Company has been a well-established creative presence in South Florida's arts community for decades. The company's intensive training classes have produced not only top-flight dance professionals, but confident, driven young adults as well. We're on Miami Beach, which is really wonderful, built especially for dancers. From three years old all the way till 19 years old, we have classes in ballet, modern, and jazz, all kinds of dance classes. The, the top levels in the school are part of what we call a pre-professional division, which means these are serious dance students, both male and female, that are vying to get a position in this company or another professional company around the country or the world. And they're training six days a week, very intense. People don't realize how difficult ballet is. You know, we work very hard. People, a lot of time, just come to see the show. And a lot of them don't realize that to see a beautiful show like they saw, it's a year of work with the frustration, the injuries, and all those things that happen. Working at it every day, it's definitely something like, sometimes we put it, all the tension in our face and we're like, like looking at ourselves in the mirror, like this is so hard, but then you have to just look like a beautiful ballerina and make it look easy. And that takes a lot of practice to get to that point. The wonderful thing about classical ballet training is it prepares a child for any career they pursue because it teaches them discipline, self-esteem, an incredible work ethic. They learn time management, they learn respect for their peers and their teachers and their directors. Well, you have to be disciplined to be a ballerina because you sit there and you do the same thing every day even though you think about different things every day but you do the same thing every day and that takes a lot of like 
it's kind of a mind game, I think. So being out in the real world, anything you do, being a ballerina, even if you're sitting at a desk all day, like you've been through that mind game and you push yourself every day, and I think that helped me in any job in the future. We are so committed to creating a strong male dance program. So we have scholarships that we offer to young boys uh, ages 7, 8, 9, 10 years old who haven't had any training before. They come and audition and if they show a proclivity for dance and movement, musicality, you know, a flair for performance, then we bring them on board and we train them. The athletic part of the competition I think is a big boost for men, you know, when they are in the class and they see that, you know, friends are pushing and turning more and jumping higher, there is a nice, healthy competition uh, with, with, with men. We're so pleased to have some of the best instructors in the world here teaching these, these students and the South Florida community should feel so proud to have such an incredible training program right here on Miami Beach producing these beautiful young dancers that are going on to professional careers. You can learn more about the Miami City Ballet by visiting miamicityballet.org. That's going to do it for this edition of Art Rocks. Remember, you can find out more about what's going on in our state on both the Art Rocks and the Country Roads Magazine websites. So until next time, I'm James Fox Smith and thanks for watching.